it's, it's an honor to be here. And because I have a problem as an educator. I've gained fame, but I haven't had any impact. <laughs> and that's a very delicate situation to be in. Huh? My son uh, and his wife, who are the inventors behind the technology I'm using, they say I have the highest fame impact ratio in the world. Because anything you divide with zero become huge. <laughs> Why is it so? Well, we have started in Gapminder Foundation, and we are a non-profit with the sole uh, uh, aim to fight devastating ignorance about the world with a fact-based worldview that everyone can understand. But we have started also to measure what people know and don't know about the world. So we started actually, we started with Sweden. This is one of the questions we put. We said that 30-year-old men in the world have been eight years to school. How long have women in the same age group been to school? To be precise, it's 25 to 34, but I sort of simplified it here. Have they been three, five, or seven years to school? Well, this is what the Swedes answer, you know? But the, 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 the delicate thing here is that the correct answer is seven years. Only 9% of the Swedes got it right. We've seen an enormous catch-up the last decades of girls going to school, taking every opportunity, being supported by their mothers and so on. So the gender gap in access to school is closing fairly rapidly, and the Swedes have missed it. So we thought perhaps the Swedes are an isolated people, so we decided we go to the UK. The Brits, they have been around all over the world, you know, so they should know better. And we asked the Brits, what is the literacy rate of the world population? And the UK population answered like this. Huh? Is it 80% who can read 60, 40, or 20? Well, the, the delicate thing here is this is the correct answer. So the Brits were equally ignorant as the Swedes. And... and, and um, we then thought that it was people with low education that dragged down the result. So we had more than 1,000 in our sample, and we could make a segment of those who have been to the fine British universities, you know. But they were even worse. <laughs> so if there's some representative from British University, I would like to speak with you afterwards. <laughs> eh? That means that something, what they answer is what was correct 30 to 40 years ago. There's no upgrading of the worldview. So then, of course, we asked the shimps. <laughs> and this is very, very, this is very shocking, you know, that you go to the zoo and you get like eight times, what is it, six times more correct answer than from British universities. <laughs> it's funny, but it's also very serious. It means that when it comes to the worldview, it's not lack of knowledge. It's some sort of active ignorance, the preconceived ideas that blocks the upgrading. It's an old, colonial, very old-fashioned worldview that we think is sticky. So we asked this question also, how many children are there in the world? And, and we used UN population data, and these are the number of billions of children in the world. One, two, three. Huh? My teacher had a pointer, and I still use honor my teacher with the pointer. <laughs> uh, 1950, when I was born, 48 years, there was less than 1 billion children in the world. And then the number of children, 0 to 15, increased and hit 2 billion by the year 2000. Now, the UN Population Division, I made a projection. It's one of these lines. The other two I made up just to make a quiz. <laughs> so what is the correct one here? The correct ones, well, by seeing the result from UK and Sweden, you know what the correct answer is. <laughs> it's very easy. You just ask the Brits and the Swedes and you know what's right. Yeah? It's what the least number they do. This, of course, made it easy for us in Gapminder to teach about an area where there, for one reason or another is ignorance, you know, is easier. But it's interesting, though, no? This is actually one of the biggest events in the history of mankind, that the number of children in the world have stopped growing, and it has been completely missed by media. That's when we in Gapminder, we came to the conclusion, we give up media. 
we go for the schools. If we would like to have a fact-based worldview, education is the place. Media is nothing to hope for. Because they always want, they always want what is short and what is news and what, what, what can be shorter. The longer-term trends, they will be conveyed in, in, in education. So how do we explain the world? We may have to make it simple, very, very simple. We divided the world into four regions, America, Africa, Europe, and we had to add Turkey here so that we could boast Europe a little. It's too small otherwise. <laughs> and then Asia here. Uh, and, and I hope the Turks would accept this. Uh, they are welcome. They are welcome. And, and, and then we are seven billion people in the world. Where do they live? One billion in America, one in Europe, one in Africa, and four in Asia. The pin code of the world is 1114. <laughs> and the students don't even know the pin code. Then they can't get into it. You know? And this is, this is the way. It is a macro level in which we don't upgrade the world. We may know details here and there and so on, but we don't affect the macro level. In 2050, there will be 1 billion more in Asia and 1 billion more in Africa. Europe has stopped growing. America will just grow a little. So by the end of this century, Asia has also stopped growing. There will be 1 billion more or 2 billion more in Asia. Now I think this is where that ignorance arises. Because it's so difficult to perceive for the countries in North America and West Europe, which I call the Old West, eh, that they will be less than 10% of the world population. And that the center of trade in the world will be the Indian Ocean. That's where 80% of the world population will be living in Asia and Africa. And Doha is indeed very well si placed here <laughs> to be a coordinator. I think the investment in this conference center is a very good one. It will be, few, <laughs> it will be filled in the future. Huh? And, 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 and this is more or less as we see the world. Now, why has this happened? Well, since ancient time, thousands of years ago, we go to the censuses in China, we go back in history, we go to the rainforest today. Women, on average, had six children, but this changed in Europe. Europe was the first to change, and the number of children born dropped slowly but steadily over the last century, the last two centuries. In America, it dropped later. There was a baby boom after the Second World War, but it was like this, down to two today. That's the whole of America, from Canada to Argentina. Uh, and then Asia dropped later, but fast. And now Africa, since 30 years back, is dropping like this. And all experts agree that this is about to happen. We have come over this. Uh, we have now going to, in, in this century, going towards a steady world population. But this is not known. And this is where we tried with our, our software to make more sense of this. Look here. I have each bubble here is a country. Uh, this is Japan here. The red ones is Asia. The yellow is Europe. The green is America. And the blue up here is Africa. Just as I showed you before. Now, uh, here is number of babies born per woman. Small families, large families. This is 50 years ago. And here is the child mortality. 100 dying per 1,000, 200 dying, and 300 dying. That means one child in three. The world was clearly divided into a Western world or a developed world or, and a developing world. You can see from the back line, back rows, you know, that it was these countries, about one billion people who had small families and low mortality, and these ones who had large families and high mortality. Qatar was there, already benefiting from well-used wealth and taking down child mortality. Bangladesh was all the way up there. I, I marked those countries so you can see what happens when I start the world. And these are data which are very good. Fertility data and mortality are the two social indicators almost we know best. So I take down the speed here so you can see what happens. And here we go. 
Ready, steady, go. Can you see child mortality is falling and after some problems here with Mao Zedong in China, China moves steadily to smaller family and uh, Latin America, this is Mexico, this is Brazil, they are following, Indonesia is coming here and look at Bangladesh and look at Qatar. Qatar is going here very fast to small families down here and, and, and Bangladesh is more or less on the same speed and almost the entire world, even many African countries, join down into this corner and we have a completely new world. Now, still countries have huge problems. There is Afghanistan there, there is Congo there, and you know the civil strife in those land, uh, countries that is holding them back. Whereas other African countries, like, like Ethiopia is here, Madagascar is down here already. There is a huge change going on. And, and, and we have found that what, the, what is known quite a lot is about the one-child policy in China. What is not so much known, and here we have regions, it's not only nations, is that Taiwan, which never had a one-child policy, they have 1.2 children per woman, they have less. Hong Kong even have one child per woman. There is another thing which happens. The average number of children is 2.5. It's a completely new world. And we can start planning an educational system now when we have a fixed number of children in the world. Huh? Now, they will change where they are in the world. If I go back here, uh, I just want to show you Ghana. If I split Ghana into its income quintile, and this is important, because there's a weak aspect of showing country average. That's the huge difference within countries. The, the, the upper quintile, the highest education and best income in Ghana are here together with Asia, and the worst off in Ghana is over here together with Afghanistan and Congo. That is within wealthy, no, not wealthy, but, but successful Ghana with a decent income level. You have this huge difference within them. Eh? So, so this is more or less what I wanted to show with the money. Uh, we, we, uh, when you divide with income. This is where we are today. Can you see the number of children have stopped growing? The biggest event in the history of mankind ever to be completely missed by media is that the number of children stop growing. I call it peak child. Huh? And this is what will happen. Children will not grow, adults will grow in the future. So this is a very ample way of, of looking at children. Of these children we have, 60 million are out of primary school. This is UNESCO's last report. 30 million have never enrolled. 15 million enroll late and 15 million drop out. That is more or less where we stand today. This is a success. It was much worse 20 years ago. It's a success coming down to this. And, and how does this distribute then across the world? How does this uh, distribute across the world? I will go back to my bubbles, but I will swap the graph and show you this instead. Huh? Here we are. Look here. I have now taken mean years in school for men, 25 to 34 years here. Uh, there have been two years, 10 years, and more. This is 1970. And here, same data for women. And you can see in 1974, the pattern was that countries first put their boys into school. And then later on, the girls would go to school. And you can see the enormous disparity we had in 1970. So many countries down here with not even one year in school on average, whereas United States was leading up there, way uh, longer schooling than the rest of the richer countries here. Now, here we go. Eh? Can you see how the world decided to catch up on US up there? Uh, and they are coming there. That's Canada. Canada is catching up with U.S. up there. Uh, and then the others are following. And they see the giants here, how China goes here, how most of the countries leave this corner down here, and how it catch up with girls in school. I have to show you an outlier here. Isn't it fantastic that Qatar is there? 11 years for women and 8.8 .8 years for men. Uh, Congratulations to the girls and women of Qatar. It's quite amazing what they have done. And we have another outlier there, United Arab Emirates. Eh? When, we, when we go back into, into history, some, some years like this, 
you can see that these two Gulf countries is really where we today have a gender advantage in school for girls and young women. And, and they are taking all these opportunities. That's why it's so wrong to maintain this idea that girls are almost not at all going to school. This is wrong. You should listen carefully to Malala when she speaks. When she's asked, why is girl not going to school? She says, because girls and boys are so poor in many families and many communities, so they have to work for the family, they cannot go to school. And then there is cultural taboo stopping girls at many places. Girls lose out from boys only when it comes to enrolling in school. Once in school, they don't have a higher dropout rate than boys. Eh? They manage, and that is not because someone is kind to them. It's them and their mothers fighting eh? and really taking all opportunities you have. And you can see that we have a relatively good gender equity. Oh, Brazil also here has more women in school than men, and Indonesia is here almost equal. Down here, of course, we have countries that still have quite a long way to go to gender equity. Eh? But it's, it's in many places at least better than it used to be. And up here in the top, we have South Korea, Canada, and Norway. Have, it's very irritating for Sweden that Norway is ahead of us. <laughs> Don't we do that all over the world? We compare to our neighbor, you know? So what we have to do here is not only look at the length of it, we have to look at the quality. This is the PISA study from, from, uh, from, uh, from uh, OECD. And, and, and though Japan, South Korea, Taiwan are doing so much better in math in eighth grade, at least for Sweden it helps out a little that Norway is doing worse here. Otherwise, we have to accept that the countries like Russia and United States are ahead of us when it comes to quality. We know that we have this double task, to get children into school and then to increase the quality once they are there. This is really the big challenge of, of today. Eh? And, and uh, I, I will show you this in the following way here. Eh? First, getting into school and staying. This is the, the UNESCO data from a number of African countries and from Yemen. Uh, uh, the first two here from Benin are the richest income quintile. This is the poorest income quintile. And these are the boys and these are the girls. So the question is, what matter worst, poverty or gender? Is Malala right or wrong when she answers as she does? This is the gender differences. They exist in all countries. These are the percent who remain in school. These are those enrolled. These are those finishing. Enrolled and finishing. We compare those who finish school. Eh? And this is the gender difference. And this is the income difference between the richest and the poorest 20%. Poverty is indeed the worst problem than gender differences, but gender difference aggravates poverty. It becomes much greater in poverty than elsewhere. And this is one of uh, the, the, uh, the graphs where you can see quality. We are working on this. We don't have animated graphic yet because we don't have these measurements over time yet. So we can show them. But there's a number of countries from Japan uh, and Netherlands, Kazakhstan, Denmark, Slovenia, mostly rich countries over here that has about, in fourth grade, they have about 100% who are still in school, that means survived, and they have fulfilled the minimum learning criteria set up for this study. And then as you go along mainly to poorer countries with weaker educational system over here, you find that the group who is increasing are those who still remain in school, but they don't fulfill the minimum criteria. And then the dropouts are out there. Isn't it very clear that we don't have developed and developing countries? We have countries all along a range. This is how we have to see the world. We can't see it. Those are the developed. Those are the developing. We see how Norway and Sweden fall back in math compared to many Asian countries, even with lower incomes. And this is what I would like to leave you with. And my clocks say that I'm out. Thank you.